uh, introduction. And okay, continue recording. Yeah, so thank you very much for that kind and warm invitation. And I have very strong feelings about Bogota and the logic group there. And of course, Andres and Maria Clara and Javier and many of us uh, have been, we've been close friends for, for decades now. And Bogota is, I think of it as a second home. And especially recently, we've been thinking about you every day, all the difficulties that you've had. So you are really in, in, our, in our hearts every day. And uh, we hope we can, we can see you soon. OK, so uh, logicality and model classes. Ah. OK, so um, uh, I, logicality is uh, is a very, there's a big literature on it. And uh, Yoko and I just decided to, to dive, dive into it. So you are not seeing th this, are you? Are, you're not seeing the speakers, I guess, right? The, the participants, all right. Okay, so, so what do we mean by the, the logical? Uh, so just starting out very simply, so to say that the syllogism all A's are B's, X is an A, X is a B, is a valid argument form is to say that the conclusion follows from the premises, no matter what predicates are substituted for the non-logical terms A and B. So man or mortal or tulip and pious or whatnot, as long as the substitution is done uniformly. That the conclusion follows from the premises is just a matter of logic. As Carnap says, is obviously true in a purely logical, logical way. Um, but what do we mean by the logical as opposed to say the, the mathematical? And notice this question is an urgent one for the logician because the model theoretic notion of consequence is parasitic on the distinction between logical and non-logical expressions, right? Because for on, on the usual account of logical consequence, we say that phi is a semantic consequence of a sentence psi if for every uniform substitution of the non-logical expressions in phi and psi. If phi is true, then so is, so is psi, right? So, so because of our notion of semantic consequence, we need a distinction between logic, the logical and the non-logical expressions, right? Or the logical constants of, of our language, formal languages. Uh, Tarski sort of started, um, a particular line of thinking in, in this logicality uh, idea. So he, he gave a lecture called What Are Logical Notions? And there he proposes a definition of logical notion or logical constants modeled on the Erlanger program. And the idea is that a notion is thought to be thought of as logical if it's invariant under all permutations of the, on, of the relevant domain. Right? And the idea is that um, in a given, let's say scientific subject area, right, the invariant concepts, the concepts which are invariant, the number of them is inversely related to the number of transformations, right? The more transformations there are, the fewer invariant notions there are. So if we think of logic as topic neutral, as many people commonly do, or the most general of all the mathematical scientists, why not declare logical notions to be the limiting, the limiting cases? So those which are closed under all possible transformations, the domain permutations. Okay, so as expected, uh, so this is a good definition at, at first glance. So the standard logical constants, conjunction, disjunction, negation, quantification uh, are all judged to be logical operations under this criterion being all isomorphism invariant. So first order definability is classified as logical, right? Being generated by, by these constants. Now later we'll talk about McGee's theorem. He generalizes this to, to L infinity infinity. Now uh, Tarski knows, notices immediately that the criterion over generates, right? In the sense that concepts you don't immediately assimilate to logic turn out to be included, such as the cardinality of the underlying domain, right? This is clearly permutation invariant cardinality. So all of a sudden, <laughs> this very, what seems to be a very good definition of logicality really seems to um, 
capture what we mean and suddenly cardinality becomes a logical notion. Um, interestingly enough, this doesn't bother uh, Tarski, right? He says, fine, it's, it is a logical notion. Um, another problem with permutation invariance has to do with domain relativity. So uh, the criterion identifies the logical operations on a fixed domain, but that a domain consists of this or that type of object shouldn't have anything to do with logicality, right? Logical concepts should be domain independent. And indeed, Guy Lachere um, tweaked the, the criterion a little bit by extending it to cover notions of variant across isomorphic structures. And accordingly, we now call it the Tarski share invariance criterion. Okay, so one way uh, I'm going to be talking about absoluteness, right? The general independence from, from the background uh, set theory. And it's generally thought that absoluteness is a necessary, right? Not sufficient, but necessary uh, condition of logical notions, right? Uh, in, in that whatever, whatever depends upon the background theory, set theory shouldn't, should be considered maybe a mathematical rather than a logical notion or some other kind of notion besides a logical notion. Um, it turns out that um, logicality is a very, very delicate thing. So Quine, of course, is well known as um, arguing against taking set theoretic notions as uh, logical. Um, in, the, in the 1940s, Tarski, Quine, Carnap, they had all these conversations, what is mathematical, what is logical, Tarski made this famous remark, mathematics is logic plus epsilon, right? They were very concerned with drawing boundary lines. Um, so for Tarski, he, he immediately sees all the complications. So, right, in, it, according to him, for example, the notion of a binary relation being a well order is is non-logical because you need the epsilon relation to define it. But the notion of a structure being a well order is logical as its second order defined. Okay, so Tarski concludes that question of logicality is, is a very difficult one. Okay, so um, setting over generation aside and considering this problem of domain relativity, it would seem that we should consider model classes in general, right, following Scher, Pfefferman, and others. Um, there's a big literature on this, right? Pfefferman has, has um, raised various, various objections, but the, the idea is, right, that this problem of domain relativity is a, is a serious one. So we, we should consider model classes in general, namely classes of structures of the same similarity type, but possibly of different cardinality that are closed under isomorphism. Okay, so how do you formulate the notion of logicality for a model class? Um, originally, the question arises in connection with connectives and quantifiers and so forth, right? But actually the question can be restated as a question about, about model classes, right? Whether the property of a model being in a given model class is a logical property of, of the model. So um, how do we get from logical operations, something like disjunction to model classes? I think this will probably be very familiar to, to uh, uh, Javier and, 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 and John and, and Andres and, and others, right? But I'll just go through it. So any relevant operation can be reformulated as a property of models. And then the logicality of the operation becomes the question whether the property is a logical property of the model. So typical examples of logical properties of a unary model uh, would be the non-emptiness of a subset or the property of being equal to the, uh, the subset being equal to the whole domain. And as we know, on the side of operators, these would correspond to existential and universal quantifiers. <clears throat> So if we want to think of these uh, of, of model classes instead of properties, right here's disjunction as a model class. Okay. On the other hand, right, note that every model class is definable in some logic because we can take the model class as a generalized quantifier in the sense of Lindstrom, right? So here is uh, here is the 
the equivalence, right? So you have a generalized quantifier here, you have a model class over here, and right, the semantics is, is designed so that um, you, you capture exactly the, uh, uh, this, this, the extension of this generalized, generalized quantifier. So this, uh, this gives you a transfer from logical operations to model classes and back because any model class can be identified with a generalized quantifier, right? So here's our picture, right? Logical operation to model class, model class is identified with a generalized quantifier, which is a logical, logical operation. Okay, <clears throat> so now our class, right? We are talking about um, adding quantifiers to first order logic. So our model class, right, is gonna be trivially definable in this logic and conversely, every class of models is definable in that uh, logic is a model class. Right. Okay, so we can immediately observe, uh, it's called, <laughs> I put theorem here, but it's very, uh, it's, it's just immediate that uh, we have the following equivalences, right? So to be closed under isomorphism, that is to be a model class, is to be definable in some extension of first order logic by a generalized quantifier, is to be definable in some, in some logic. Okay. So corollary, a logic, an operation is a logical operation if and only if it can be expressed in some logic. Okay. Now, a theorem of, of Van McGee improves some logic to a very specific logic, namely L infinity infinity, but we pay the price of getting a different definition for each cardinal separately. Okay, so in order to state McGee's theorem, we have to um, identify this property of cardinality dependence. So for any cardinal lambda, let K lambda be the class of elements of the model class K with domain of size lambda. So we're carving up the model class and the uh, elements of any cell, they all have, uh, they're all going to have the same, we, we, we identify them because they have the same cardinal. Okay, so um, definition, a model class is cardinal dependently definable or CD definable in a logic if K lambda, the cells, is, lambda, is L star definable for every lambda. By the way, I, if I'm going too fast, let me know. <laughs> This is all things that I, oh, these sorry. are all things sorry. that you know, you all know most of these things. We're going to wade into some deep waters pretty soon. So, okay. So um, notice that a model class can be CD definable, cardinal dependently definable, even in first order logic without being definable in even in L infinity infinity, right? So here's an example I'm going to return to. So we consider the class of models where the domain is a limit cardinal and P is, uh, our, our predicate P is empty or else the domain has the cardinality of a successor and the predicate is non-empty. Now, I've just defined this class in a first order way in every cardinality, right? This is CD definable in first order logic, in other words. But it's a consequence of the lowenheim skolem theorem for L infinity infinity, it's in the footnote, um, that this model class can't be definable in it, right? And a simple argument, if the class is definable by a formula in L kappa plus kappa plus, Right, we can use the lowenheim skolem theorem to move from a model of phi and exist x p x of successor cardinality to a submodel of limit cardinality, and therefore violate the definition of the of the class. So, just just to make sure I understand this, C D uh -huh. definable is is actually a ski. That, that is, there's one definition for each cardinal. Uh, no, no. Well, we. I, so I'm. I'm. So the cardinal is a parameter in the definition. Is that? Is that what? Yeah. That, that, yeah. That's. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, so the definition takes takes a cardinal number as a parameter. Yeah. yeah. Is that okay, John? 
Well, so notice I have one logic. It, 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 yeah. I, I have one model class, I have one logic. And what I'm saying is if you carve the model class up right. according to the cardinalities of the domain, right? Then we say the whole class is cardinal definable, cardinal dependently definable if each k lambda is definable in that same logic for every lambda. Yeah, but, but it but is. You, but you need a proper class of, of formulas for the definition. So that's uh, the weakness of it. Well, I mean, not necessarily. She gave one. Yeah, not, I, not, I mean, not she used, she used only two formulas in her example. Yes, okay, okay, but in the worst case. Yeah, 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 in the worst case, yes. Okay, okay, shall I go on? Yes. Yeah, okay. Okay, so um, there we are. So here's, so with that sort of caveat about L infinity infinity, which we are also, we're going to really <laughs> take an ax to it later on in the talk. But so that was just a, you know, first taste of that kind of thing. But um, so here's McGee's theorem uh, has sparked a huge literature, right? If K is a class of models of the same vocabulary, then the following conditions are equivalent. K is closed under isomorphisms. K is CD definable in L infinity infinity. Okay sketch of a proof, you just write down everything that happens in the model class, essentially. Okay? <laughs> yeah. That's, okay. Huge All right. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, you, you have this huge disjunction that somehow- Yeah, you have this huge disjunction of yeah. all the formulas defining all the, yeah. Okay, so um, now, didn't we just solve the problem of cardinal dependence, right? Recall, I gave this, this little observation above, this immediate observation above. Um, so this is not, uh, this, this uh, theorem doesn't depend upon the cardinality of the model, but we get a different logic for each model class, right? So we haven't really made any progress there. Okay, so notice the fact that McGee's theorem depends on the cardinality of the models in the class means that the sentence, uh, right, we, well, it's cardinal dependent, right? So the example that I gave, this K lim, when we're asking whether the property of a model belonging to that class is logical or not, we're essentially asking whether um, having a limit cardinality is, is logical or not. Now, according to the Tarski share criterion, it, it undoubtedly is logical. Um, uh, on the other hand, <laughs> that doesn't sound quite right. Um, so we are going to uh, we are going to um, uh, present a different a different analysis, and K Lim in our analysis manifests a rather low level of of logicality. Okay, so. Um, so the idea here is whether uh, L infinity infinity can be replaced by a tamer logic, meaning one closer to being first order, right? Not tame in the sense of you, John, and, and all you model theory, right? Uh, one closer to, to being first order in its model theoretic properties. If such were to exist, and even with the problem of cardinality dependence, the logicality claim would be strengthened by virtue of uh, the logic's proximity to first order, or first order logic. So Yoko proved this theorem, right? Uh, there you see the delta operation, which you, you, if you've been hearing, listening to Yoko's talks, you, you're somewhat familiar with it. it. Involves redux of classes and their complements. But um, so just. Uh, just to, to show you the theorem and then I will return to it later when I talk about an absolute logic, right? L infinity, infinity is certainly not absolute, but this logic is an absolute logic. So that's the improvement uh, along with a number of other improvements. Okay, um, so now I'm going to uh, focus a little bit more on the lowenheim skolem theorem and uh, talk about a very beautiful paper by Gil Sagi of Haifa called Logicality and Meaning. 
so we just need the definition of the Lowenheim number of a logic, the smallest cardinal, such that if a sentence has a model, it has a model of cardinality less than kappa. I'll be talking about Hanf numbers later. The Hanf number of a logic is the smallest cardinal, such that you have an upward Lowenheim scholem theorem from that point on. So if a sentence has a model uh, of size kappa, it has uh, at least size kappa, it has arbitrarily large models. Now, Sagi makes this, this beautiful observation in her paper that the Lowenheim number encodes the degree to which the logic is indifferent to cardinality. So that's the founding insight of her paper. This is due to the fact that the validities which are captured in the full range of models are already captured on an initial segment. Okay, so in the case of first order logic, the lowenheim skolan theorem tells us that kappa can be taken to be L of zero. So in this sense, first order logic is indifferent to cardinalities above L of zero. Now, first order logic is already classified as logical under, under permutation invariance. So this is now witnessed by the Lohenheim Skolem theorem. Okay, so as, as I said, Savi's observation, just to repeat, is that the, the, um, the degree of the indifference to cardinality of a logic is measured by its Lohenheim number. Now we've seen logics of the form LQ, so this is always first order logic with a generalized quantifier appended. The Lohenheim number of first order logic is of course L of zero. And for each alpha, the Lohenheim number of the logic LQ alpha is L of alpha, right? Where Q alpha X phi X means there are at least L of any, L of, L of alpha many X of so phi X. Okay, so we have a nice matching here. The Lohenheim number of this logic is alpha. Okay. So uh, the quantifier Q alpha is then in a sense indifferent to cardinalities greater than L of alpha. So uh, we have a maximal element, right? First order logic and LQ zero are maximally logical under the criterion and the degree of logicality decreases as alpha increases. So if alpha is less than beta, then Gil Sagi will say that Q alpha is more logical than Q beta. Okay, so uh, Sagi's criterion is based on a certain philosophical position, so a metaphysical view of the cumulative hierarchy of sets, as well as a view about how the meaning of the terms of a logic are, are fixed. So she says the lower the cardinalities to which the meaning of a term may be sensitive, the more logical it is. Um, we view Lohenheim numbers as telling us how much structure a term, in this case, the quantifiers Q alpha requires in order to be fixed in the context of a logic. Okay, so Sagi's criterion. Uh, criterion? Yeah? Is this Sagi's criterion of logic yes. logicality or? Okay. Yes. Can, yeah. can you just slow that slide down? That one, John? Yeah. So, right, she just, she just looks at the cum cumulative hierarchy as being metaphysically, uh, you know, as, as calibrating metaphysical involvement, the higher up you go, right? So you wanna, be, you wanna be low down. I mean, the relevant properties of a logic, you want, you want them to be as, as far down as possible. Yeah, she talks a lot about metaphysical involvement and so on. Now we're taking a, a different a different approach. So, um, you know, I I'm I am not one, <laughs> as you all know, to talk about metaphysical commitments of set theory as being a problem or existing or as being worthy of saying anything about. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, so so you know, there's no such, uh, there's no, no idea of that kind here. So the, our idea, Yoko's and my idea, is that if we take first order logic to be the fundamental exemplar of logicality, controversial, yes, but uh, we, we do take it as such, then logics that resemble to a degree first order logic in their model theoretic properties should be graded as logical to that degree. So I like very much in logic when you have these graded notions, right? I mean, people always want, you know, 
and all, all or nothing, <laughs> but like, right, formalism, independence or something like that, right? Another graded notion. Logicality is really a graded notion. Okay, so for example, under our point criterion, our first orderism, logics such as LQ1 have arguably a higher degree of logicality than LQ0 on the basis of the completeness of the former with respect to the Kiesler axioms. Okay, now just to spend a moment talking about, um, you know, why take first order logic to uh, exemplify logicality. Well, this is really where the discussion of logicality begins, right? We talk about uh, uh, under almost any uh, um, definition or criterion of logicality, first order logic always, always wins immediately. Um, so right, there's, a, there's a consensus that the connectives and quantifiers are indeed logical operations. First order logic is just consists of finite iterations of these operations, right? So why would logicality vanish? Uh, in this iteration. Of course, if we go beyond first order logic to infinitary connectives and generalized quantifiers and so on, then the question starts to emerge, right? Whether we remain in the realm of, of logicality. Okay, so um, we take up, Sagi suggested that log logicality may be calibrated by Lowenheim numbers, but uh, we also give weight to the uh, uh, other model theoretic properties of a logic, such as whether they have a completeness theorem or not. Um, so logics that have a completeness theorem, right, are not tied to the Aleph hierarchy in an, in an obvious way, right? Some of these logics are axiomatizable and some, some are not, for example. Um, Quine, right, a, a radical first orderist, right, he always emphasized the completeness theorem as evidence of the logicality of first order logic, right, asserting it as proof of the existence of an integrated domain of logical theory with bold and significant boundaries, right. Okay, uh, so we dealt with Q0 and Q alpha, right, other quantifiers, right, the Rescher quantifier or the equicardinality or as it's called the Hartig quantifier. These have the uh, uh, very high Lowenheim number and thus are less logical um, than uh, my screen is blocked. Uh, I'm not seeing my, my the, the right hand, right side of my computer is as if somebody took black paint and just painted on it. Um, are less logical, at least for alpha below the first uh, fixed point. Okay, now uh, the heretic quantifier is an odd case, right? So under the SAGI criterion, it's not very logical at all. And yet, right, what is the Hartig quantifier? It, it talks about equicardinality, right? Which is a core concept of isomorphism invariance. So it's kind of odd that it's, it's graded so low on the logicality uh, scale, but um, uh, also under our criteria, right, it's, it's classified as weakly logic, weakly logical due to its high Lowenheim number, but also because it lacks very seriously a complete axiomatization, and that's Yoko's 1980 result. Okay, so what about, um, so taking the perspective of the completeness theorem, Right, um, as we said, logics that have a completeness theorem are tied to the Aleph hierarchy in an obvious way, right? So Kiesler's axioms are complete for LQ1 and if GCH is assumed they're complete for all alpha, Aleph alpha plus one, for which Aleph alpha is regular, so for all the Aleph ends. Whereas while L LQ0 satisfies the Kiesler axioms, right? They, these are, or any other recursive set of axioms are not, are not a complete axiomatization of LQ0. Okay, um, so our criterion of logicality, which turns on the degree to which a logic represents first order logic and its model theoretic properties, comes apart from Sagi's already at the level of LQ0 and LQ1. Okay, um, so uh, a possible objection might come from the fact that Kiesler's axioms are satisfied by many different quantifiers. In fact, by every Q alpha where alpha, alpha is regular, 
Um, but right, you may consider Q, Q1 to be logical. What's logical is not so much the cardinality LF1 as simply uncountable cardinality or, or very many. Okay, well, the failure to permit, permit a recursive axiomatization, this is an indication that there's something mathematical as against logical there. Okay. Uh, all right, so by bringing in completeness, <clears throat> we can make finer distinctions, right? So under our criterion, as I've said, Q1 is more logical than Q9. Um, I should mention here, Dog Westerstall, right, work on these and other quantifiers with, with Dog is ongoing. He's made a tremendous contribution to, to this area, written very beautiful papers about um, logicality and uh, with, with Denis Bonnet and, and, and others. Okay, so Sagi um, says in her paper, right, well, okay, completeness might be important, but we should distinguish between a logic we use to measure the logicality of Q of a quantifier and the logic we ultimately use for validity and logical consequence. Um, but if metaphysical involvement is inversely related to logicality, then having a completeness theorem should be very important, um, should be considered an important marker of logicality also under her criterion, because what does a completeness do, theorem do? It enables you to convert semantic content, which is metaphysically involved, presumably, into syntactic content, which presumably is not. Okay, so, so also under her... I have, one, I have one question here, Juliet. Yeah, yeah. So the quote you have from Sagi, we should distinguish between, between a logic used to measure the logicality of Q and the logic we ultimately use for validity and logical consequence. Is she referring to some sort of underlying logic, the second one, where we actually argue about all these things? Is she kind of a contrasting, a kind of a, you know, like meta level of logic? as opposed to the logic uh, as an object that appears in the first line? Is that is this what's happening? Yeah, there? yeah, yeah. That, that um, you know, we might want something that's metaphys <clears throat> metaphysically heavier in her terminology for validity and, and logical, logical consequence, right? Um, but hmm. if we're thinking about logicality, right? Yeah, it's 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 a remark that invites a lot of a lot of thought, though. I mean, there's a lot to say about this, but I'm I'm a little concerned about time. So if it's okay, I can just move on. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So um, back to McGee's theorem, and I'll I'll just go through this very very quickly, right? Um, so we're going to talk about uh, L infinity infinity and and you know why McGee's theorem, although it's generated this huge literature, it's a very nice theorem, but it it should you know it's often taken as the final word on logicality, and maybe this isn't really um, the right thing to do. So let's recall what an absolute logic is, right? So uh, a logic is absolute if if the if belonging to the signature is uh, sigma one, um, uh, and the satisfaction predicate is, del is delta one in phi. Now I'm just saying, what is phi doing there? Uh, I think there's a type. Or the, there's a typo, yeah. Yeah, the, just belonging, belonging to, the to the signature. Belonging to the set of formulas of the signature. Yeah, yeah. So phi yeah. is a yeah. member of the so yeah. sigma. Yeah, okay. So belonging to the signature is sigma one and satisfaction predicate is, is delta one. Okay, so uh, first order logic, L infinity omega and uh, uh, the logic with well ordering, these are absolute logics, but of course L infinity infinity is not. Um, uh, it also fails to have a strong lowenheim skolem theorem Right, strong meaning covering many cardinals and leaving only few gaps. And it's unbounded in the sense that it can define the concept of a well ordering leading to very large Hanf numbers. So large Hanf number means you have a big delay until you reach an upward Lowenheim-Skolem theorem. 
okay, that L infinity infinity is not absolute, right? Um, that's a very easy argument, right? By Koenig's theorem, right? If you consider this sentence, it depends upon the cofinalities, um, cofinality of, of, this, of this mu here, but as we know, you can fool with, with cofinalities, right? So this sentence cannot, uh, um, Will, will violate absoluteness, right? Um, the logics behind McGee's theorem, L kappa plus kappa plus, right? Making up L infinity infinity, fail in a strong sense to have a completeness theorem, right? So that's a second divergence from first order logic. Um, so Dana Scott, right? The set of validities of L kappa plus kappa plus is not L kappa plus kappa plus definable over H kappa plus. Right, the set of sets of hereditary, hereditary cardinality less than or equal to kappa. In contrast, the set of valid sentences of L kappa omega, right? These two almost look alike, right? But we've, we replace the second kappa plus by omega and suddenly this is sigma one definable over H kappa plus, right? And this of course is reminiscent of the completeness theorem for first order logic where the set of validities is, right? Is, is RE, right? Sigma one over hereditarily finite sets. Okay, now we're really gonna focus on the Lowenheim Skolem theorem, right? So in addition to uh, absoluteness, another important property of first order logic is its Lowenheim Skolem theorem, right? As we said, uh, the mu in the above sentence, right? It can't have cofinality. Yeah? What's the sentence? This one. And so what, what does this say? A any? So it's enumerate, it's defining all the countable sets of the domain. Okay, fine. All right, so it has models exactly in cardinalities so that mu to the omega is, is mu, right? So this is extensionality, this part here. Ah, okay. And this says if I have a countable set, right, then um, I, I can list the elements of it. Fine, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so the idea is that um, L infinity infinity can omit car cardinals of cofinality omega in this special sense, right? So it has, it has gaps, right? So, uh, right, whereas L, L kappa plus omega, Right. If a definable model class has a model of cardinality lambda less than greater than kappa, then it has models of all cardinalities mu in between kappa and lambda, whatever their cofinality. Okay. So this leads to the notion of of the spectrum of a model class. Now, I think Gill mentions a spectra. She she um, in, in in sort of passing. For us, it's a central, a central concept. So um, here's a definition of the spectrum of a model class, right? So this is simply the class of cardinalities of the models in the class, right? Something that uh, those of you who work with Saharan <laughs> are very familiar with, right? So we have a model class, it's got models in it of all kinds of cardinalities. We collect up all those cardinalities and, uh, in, 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 and we're going to call that the spectrum. Okay, so uh, trivially, any set of cardinals can be the spectrum of a logic by a generalized quantifier, right? But that's, um, that's kind of a silly observation. So depending on the class, the spectrum can be a singleton, an interval, an initial or final segment, or something much more complica complicated, right? Uh, class of all limit cardinals or cofinality co omega and so on. Okay, so here's a, a picture <clears throat> of the spectra of some model classes, right? Two typical, here's a spectrum, here's another spectrum of a definable class, another definable class in L kappa omega, right? Two typical spectra of L kappa kappa. Okay, so our whole point of this talk, or one of the points of this talk, is that the spectrum 
right? The property of a logic which reflects regularity patterns in its spectra is captured by the Lohenheim Skolem theorem, right? In this way. Um, so the spectrum gives indirect information regarding the possibility that the model class is definable in some logic. So if the logic has a strong Lohenheim Skolem property, right, covering many cardinals, then the spectrum reflects this. Um, in, the, in the case of the Lohenheim Skolem property for first order logic, right, every spectrum with an infinite cardinal in it also has L of zero in it, right? So, um, uh, we, we define this, uh, so here's a, here's a convenient, convenient concept for studying spectra. So we suppose we have two classes of cardinal numbers. We say that a logic L star satisfies the Lohenheim Skolem property LSCD. If every sentence in L star, which has a model of some cardinality in C, has a model of some cardinality in D. Okay, so one way of saying, one way of writing what Skolem did, he proved that first order logic satisfies LS of uh, that, uh, the, the interval above, above L of zero, comma L of zero, right? And um, yeah, I'll skip this slide. Okay, so if a logic satisfies LSCD, there are consequences for the spectra, right, as we saw. So if a, if, if a class is definable in a logic with LSCD, right, then clearly if we have a model in the class with cardinality uh, in C, uh, cardinality of the domain in C, then there has to be a model in the class whose cardinality is in D. Right? Very simple and obvious observation. On the other hand, if K, if a class contains a model of cardinality kappa, but no models of cardinality lambda, then the class cannot be definable in a logic LSCD if kappa belongs to C and lambda is in D. So the point is that by looking at the spectrum of the class, we can make inferences about its definability in different logics. Okay, so uh, if we're given a model class K, but no logic in which it would be definable apart from trivially the uh, generalized quantifier associated to the class, and we can discern, right? So we have no logic, we have no syntax, but we have a regular spectrum. That can be taken as indirect indication, albeit not a proof that the class is definable in a logic with LSCD for some C and D explaining the found patterns, right? On the other hand, if the spectrum is irregular, right, we can take it as an indication that this is hopeless, try to find a syntax uh, uh, or, or a logic for, for the class, right? So incidentally, right, this is not always true. So the spectra for second order logic can be very wild, right? As uh, by, by Magador's uh, thesis result, right, the Hanf and Lohenheim numbers for second order logic are in the range of super compact cardinals. Okay, so the point here is that the spectrum gives implicit information about the possibility of finding a syntax for the class, right? I've always been very interested in this idea of uh, reading a syntax off, off of a model class. Well, not always. John, this is a footnote in John's wonderful book, right? This idea of whether a model class has a natural logic or natural syntax. So here's, right, here's an irregular spectrum, right? Here's a regular one. Okay, so here we're going to say, we may not have a syntax or a logic for the class, but there ought to be one here, maybe, maybe not. Okay, so basic facts about um, these kinds of properties, right? I, I can send you the slide, you can go, you can go through them, but you see we have very nice um, Lohenheim Skolem properties for L kappa plus omega and other related uh, logics. Okay, now we talked about McGee's theorem and um, the idea that L infinity infinity is not only very far from, uh, is, is very far from first order logic. Can you, um, 
replace L infinity infinity by an absolute logic, right? Still cardinal dependently perhaps, but um, doing a little bit better on, on, the logical, on the logical side. And McGee alludes to such a possibility on his, in, in, his, in his paper. Um, now we can't just simply re right, peel off that second infinity and replace it by L infinity infinity because um, Q1 is not CD definable in, um, uh, in, in uh, uh, L infinity, uh, well, as L, L infinity infinity, I guess, no, right? I think you mean. Uh, omega, L infinity omega. Is it, it's, yeah, L infinity and L infinity omega, right? No. Okay. L infinity omega. Yeah. L infinity omega, yeah. Okay, so, um, so what is the absolute logic? So here, uh, the delta extension of a logic. I'll just go through this uh, quickly. So this involves, so right, we have a, a model class. Um, uh, we consider the class of redux of models to sublanguages, right? These are projections. And then we say uh, a model class is delta definable uh, if the, both the class and the complement of the class are sigma L star definable, right? In other words, if the both the class and its complement are um, projections. Okay, so some nice properties of the delta operation, right? They are many, right? If uh, L star has a nice spectrum, then so does the delta operation of L star, uh, satisfies the compactness theorem, if and only if L star does L LSCD, and, and so on. Craig interpolation, same Lowenheim number, same uh, Hanf number. Okay, there's a slight, there's a slight technical um, complication. I'll just leave it on, on the slide. So it's, it's, an, it's an absolute star logic, right? So we get absoluteness with a little tiny uh, caveat, right? But here is, in, in any case, the theorem. So I go into it in, in my book. It's also, um, there are many other um, sources, ref references on the slide. So here's the improvement of McGee's theorem. Right? If K is a class of models of the same vocabulary, then K is closed under isomorphism if it's CD definable in delta of L infinity omega. Okay, and this is, uh, this is certainly an, an improvement, right? L infinity omega is, is an absolute logic and the delta operation inherits much of the absoluteness of L infinity omega. See the above uh, note. Right, there's a little complication there. Um, uh, it's, it's a much tamer logic. It has a strong lowenheim skolem theorem. And the class of well orderings is not definable in uh, the delta of L infinity omega. Well, it is definable in L, L omega one omega one, and this is uh, as as uh, you know. For those of you who've heard Yoko's talks over the years, this is an important threshold difference. Well, for many, I suppose. So uh, logics in which the concept of a well order is not definable; well, these are much better behaved than those in which it is. Right. So if a well order is definable, the logic can talk about well-founded models of set theory, and there are by about transitive models of set theory leading to a breakdown of most familiar model theoretic properties. And <laughs> Yoko puts this very dramatically, uh, leading to a breakdown of the object theory, meta theory barrier. So the object theory is reaching back to the, reaching into the background set theory. Okay, <clears throat> the half number of the delta uh, of L kappa plus omega is only moderately large. Um, now, the delta, delta of L infinity omega, right, a weakness is that it doesn't have an explicit, as explicit a syntax, right, as L infinity infinity, clearly, 
Um, but this can be this can be overcome, right? Its spectra are as regular as we said as those of L infinity omega, and it is equally completely axiomatizable and absolute star. Okay, and finally, um, I'll just um, right. So, can you get rid of cardinal dependence altogether. So now we've got an absolute logic or an absolute star logic. Uh, can we get rid of cardinal dependence? Um, McGee's remark is that we can take a class size disjunction, right? Which um, is a bold move. <laughs> uh, class size disjunction of, of these sentences and obtain a single sentence which works in all cardinalities. But then if you accept class size formulas, you should also accept class size logical operations. And then we're back to the beginning, right? We start climbing up the type hierarchy beyond first order set theory, right? Now you could take every model class as a generalized quantifier, but there's a more canonical logic for the task. This is Yoko's uh, sort logic. I will just um, refer you to his uh, papers on on that and but it is a logic in which um, you can it's not absolute certainly but you can uh, o overcome this um, cardinal cardinal dependence okay so the talk our our paper is coming out here it will appear in the BSL where where on the second round of our, our refereeing and um, they, they've given it a pass. So thanks, thanks for your patience. You've been very patient. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Juliet, for this beautiful and uh, you know, overwhelming uh, you know, kind of a, <laughs> uh, you know, long voyage through many, many, many areas. Really, you know, I think at least in my case, uh, I have to look at the slides and uh, you know take a lot of time to kind of uh, distill a lot of ideas and uh, a lot of questions. Let us see if we have questions from the audience. Anyone wants to ask uh, something? I have some questions, but let us hear some questions by by other people. So I have a question for you. So this idea of a wild spectrum indicating a failure to find a syntax or find a logic. I mean, is this something that people must have come across this kind of thing in, yeah. you know, especially who work with Saharan? Yeah, uh, I was thinking, uh, first of all, how do you characterize regularity of a spectrum? Because, I mean, you gave- You just look at it. <laughs> and, uh, I was thinking if it has connections with uh, like, a. Uh, SCH or, you know, like a singular cardinals hypothesis of some sort or, you know, some kind of a variant of the singular cardinals hypothesis. Because in a way, spectra, I mean, where they start behaving strangely for some logics, it seems to be related to like, uh, you know, like Beth, uh, the, the behavior of, uh, you know, fixed point of Beth or things like that. At least, you know, if one tries to, to construct them. But this is only looking at a fragment of all possible logics, and I am sure there must be a lot of uh, other uh, phenomena. So I was trying to think, how does one organize car cardinals? And uh, in a way, a theory, you know, originally built for completely different purposes, to organize spectra of cardinalities or sets of cardinalities in general, is PCF theory. So PCF, I mean, the birth of PCF was, you know, as we know, as we know well yeah. somewhere else. And, uh, but uh, PCF, does provide, you know, it provides a topology, topology for, well, usually for an initial segment of cardinals, but uh, one can extend it to a topology of cardinals. And it yeah. is a topology, I mean, it doesn't, not just, you know, some some topology, but it, it is a topology that allows doing a lot of uh, localizations. I mean, it is a topology that has a very strong geometrical flavor. This has not been explored by anyone, by the way. I mean, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we mark that Todd Isworth, the set theorist, at some point, when he was a postdoc in Jerusalem, we were sharing an office and we were working in Saharan. And he was, you know, just arrived from his PhD from the United States, and he was overwhelmed. Who? Uh, Who was it? Todd Eisworth. Oh, uh huh. Oh, yeah. 
and uh, he was completely and, and at some point he kind of discovered that PCF theory ha- was you know full of like Fubini like theorems and like uh, uh-huh. he went to Saharan and so like, like, like of course but this of course by Saharan it's not it's, <laughs> It's not, not very, it's not anywhere. usually very <laughs> informative. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then he pushes yeah. you out of the office and sends you some yellow pages. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, um, uh, yeah. So no, that's a good. To Todd and, and Todd telling me, look, PCF theory, the way it's written, it's, it looks like, a, you know, well, the, the, you know, yeah. all these ultra filters and all the ideals, and it is very nice. But what's really crucial here is we, we have all these kind of measure theoretic phenomena. And I think it goes well beyond that. At some point, Saharon gave a uh, description of PCF theory in terms of like localizations in number theory. And I think it, well, coming from Saharon, that's a strange phrase. You know, number theory is not uh, something that uh, Saharon uh, mentions very often. But I think yeah. Greg wrote that. Sorry? I said, I think Greg wrote that. Greg. Oh, Dr. Dr. Wrote that. Mm. Okay, okay. So, yeah. In, in, so, but in a way, I started um, kind of uh, paying attention to, to this at some point and uh, discussing uh, oh, a little bit. There is this set theorist in, in uh, Sicily, Santi Spadaro, who, mm-hmm. you know, he has been kind of uh, preoccupied with singular cardinal phenomena and all of these kind of converges. So going back to your question, uh, how does one organize spectra? Maybe yeah. not, I mean, I, I don't <coughs> Just apply PCF because it, it doesn't really work uh, in, in such a simple way, but you know, well, PCF I, is already there as a way yeah. to, to organize cardinalities in a, in a different way. And it, I have a feeling, have a ch- hunch that it may be related one way or the other. I don't know if uh, anyone here uh, has uh, anything to add about this, this connection because I am sure, or maybe, maybe Javier, maybe, uh, you know, John and Yoko or, uh, where else? Well, Yoko is uh, a co-author of the paper, <laughs> but um, yeah, I guess I guess so. That's one thing, and I guess and the other question is, you know, there's such a huge lecture on logicality, and so many things are taken. Like McGee's theorem is is like the Bible, the you know the first line of Genesis or something, and it's and so you know we we make some very you know, not basic observations, but, you know, sort of general, generally available observations about um, this. And then Yoko was able to prove, you know, that in fact, this delta operation gives you a much better, gives you a much better logic. Um, So, um, you know, that was so, but, but I think it's interesting that this idea of logicality is very elusive, actually, you know, I mean, we all think of we all think of it as something we understand very easily, and yet you get this avalanche of other cardinality and being non-empty. <laughs> you know, you get all these uh, all these things which you never think of as logical notions. So, you know, I, I think it's interesting that um, Tarski understood this very well and he he ends the lecture by saying look you know i would never argue for the idea that there is a core concept there that we're trying to capture you know so um he he uh he uh um oh is that Juan? is that patricia um <laughs> uh, so you know i think it's interesting just methodologically right we don't always hey patricia we don't we don't always have we don't always have to work with you know true or false or you know incomplete or complete you know we can kind of you know work the earth and get complicated graded concepts and work in a more sensitive way so that's uh, what i thought so um i i was so uh happy to give this talk that I thought we would uh, go out afterwards to a restaurant and um, drink a glass of wine. But now since we've run late, we might lose our our, our reservation. So Yoko, can you call Elita? And, okay, okay. Yeah. But John, you had a question? Yeah, I, I, this sort of picks up on what, what Andres was asking about. Uh, what I noticed was at, at 
the first part of the of the uh, of the talk, you were using model classes in the sense of the model theoretic logic paper, where uh, th th there is no the definition does not require a proof. Theory. Doesn't require yeah just. A yeah. class of structures closed under isomorphism. Yeah. Well, no, a class of structures closed under isomorphism with a syntax and a definition of truth. No, no, no. That's but not, yeah, no, but that wasn't not, that well, well I mean we can no, give no, it no, a no, logic. You, you had the yeah, you you yeah. But yeah, what, that's yeah, a delicate point. Logic, and, that, you know, that's what a logic I knew you would yeah, I knew you would pick up on this. Yeah, so so I wanted to talk about model classes and, and very general, right? No, okay, no, I'm sorry. I, I think I mis, misspoke. You're right. You have model classes where just things closer to isomorphism. Yeah. Then you talk about logics, and logics do not necessarily have a proof system. And then in the second part of the talk, you're talking about the effect of having a proof system. And... And, and 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 the value of it. I mean, it, it, it's yeah. a good thing. You're saying. But but then you also made this remark about the existence of a proof system somehow being related to the regularity of the spectrum. Um, did I? Uh, yes. I mean, I'm not. I, I'm not. I, I think I mean this in exactly as vague a way as I said. And, <laughs> and, well, and, and, and I, by and coincidence. I something about whether that, I don't know whether you were just asking whether that happens or whether you- No, I think by coincidence, you know, there are some logics which have a completeness theorem, which have very regular spectra. Um, I don't think I was making any kind of general well, so, so maybe my question is, is there some, is there a theorem lurking here? That if right, you have, right, yeah. Yeah, you that's a, a good question. Yoko's on the phone to the restaurant. But yeah, that's right. So there should be a theorem there relating completeness well, to not. regularity of spectrum. I mean, Yoko may also have counterexamples in right of way. It's not. Yeah. So what, what is the, the uh, proposal? The theorem? question is, well, is, is, is the first question is, is the restaurant going to let us in? <laughs> uh, they were busy. OK, and the second question. OK. If, if, you, if you have a a proof system. I mean, there's two issues. One is having a proof system and then stronger having a completeness theorem. Mm -hmm. And is either of these related to some sort of downward Lowenheim scholum? Or, or more generally- Or regularity. To, to, to more, or more generally to regularity, whatever that means. Of spectra. Well, just visual, it's just a visual, visually regular. Yes, it's a good good question. Uh, yeah. Us usually, the proof of the completeness theorem probably gives some kind of Levenham scholar, because it is the proof of a completeness is almost by definition yeah. a moral construction, and if yeah. you can construct a model, probably the model is relatively small. But but this is this is not really a theorem. This is just a, a, a sort of social sociological observation that. But I, uh, so. I, I I want to build on this sociological observation because sometimes uh, looking at the proof and adapting it gives something else. Like uh, for instance, at some point when proving Lindstrom theorem, uh, one really does undefinability of well order in some sense, or one does mm -hmm. you know, or or one plays with union of models and the being closed under union of models in some sense. And then, of course, for first order, it all works perfectly. And then for other logics, as we know, things start falling apart and you can measure how they fall apart. So that's another proof. You know, the yeah. proof of, uh, of Lindstrom theorem is another one that can be, you know, what in which part of the proof do, does it break and how does it break? How does it measure some kind of failure of uh, regularity? Yeah. Or it's, I noticed Luis Carlos has a very beautiful question whether um, uh, this idea of logical property is similar to the idea of pure concept in Kant. Luis, can we, can you, can you we can write you to each you, other you, uh, about this? Yeah? Yeah, no problem, no problem. Okay, and if you write in Spanish, I can, I can struggle through it, um, but that's a very, very beautiful question and I'd, I'd love to, to think about it. About, so, about the trans, trans question, if you have a completeness, then you have 
the validities are E. So validity is absolute in, in, in set theory. So therefore, if you have validity, you have validity in HC, hereditary countable. So yeah. you must have some kind of Levenhaus column theory. Yeah. Okay, well, we're gonna go soon. Jess, can you say hello to us? Can you un unmute and un maybe she's off cooking? Yeah. No. Oh. Okay, we should appear. <laughs> I have okay. another question. Another quick question, maybe because your restaurant, I don't know if the, the reservation is. No, it's, it's okay. The restaurant is fine. Okay. Let's have the question. Okay. okay. So one, one of the sides of all, you know, McGee and then all the generalizations uh, or, you know, improvements, one side is being closed under uh, isomorphism. Uh, I, I was trying to think how can that be kind of, uh, in, you know, analyzed in some way because especially in conversations with uh, Javier recently, and also uh, you know, some, some recent connection to virtual cardinals. Um, what really is at stake is maybe you don't want just closure under isomorphisms, you know, having the isomorphisms and so on, but maybe you have some kind of partial situation where you have, you know, like a partial system of, of isomorphisms, like CARP and CARP, you mentioned CARP in a, your lecture. And yeah. So and one could say, well, what if you have some kind of back and forth system, but somehow you don't have the isomorphism in the end? Yeah. Or maybe some fourth system, like in a forcing situation, and then you don't have. So yeah, bon Bonnet the, has studied this. Yeah, Bonnet, Bonnet has studied this. Denis Bonnet who, has who, studied. But, but Denis Bonnet, who works, okay. bio, who the, works with um, Westerstall, the, he studied this. Idea of permutative uh, potential isomorphism, and what is the result? That you can replace L infinity infinity by L infinity omega for potential isomorphism. Yeah, that's very oh, really nice yes. because L infinity omega, and and then you have delta of L infinity omega, which is really kind of a in between, although it yeah. is much weaker because it doesn't define well order, but. Uh, you, you know, this sort of, uh, you know, having the isomorphism or having just potential isomorphisms, I, I, I think it is another thing there that is kind of uh, natural. So I'm glad that uh, the question was not so... Uh, uh, yeah, crazy. yeah. Okay, okay. Now, there's a huge literature. There's also Dog Westerstall's work okay. is very... Um, so he has a very beautiful group of papers with Bonnet on... Uh, logical, he sets up a functorial relation between the logical constants and the notion of consequence um, of the logic. And he proves that they're sort of functorially uh, related, right? That you can't think about, which makes sense, right? You can't think about the notion of logical constant without thinking about the notion yeah. of consequence, right? Um, and it covers so, also other semantics, like intuitionistic uh, semantics. And yeah, yeah. Propositional. And, and but it has to be um, the the uh, it, it, you need compositionality as far as I as far as I remember. But it's a whole group of papers, and I taught them in a seminar on um, on logical consequence a couple of years ago, and the students really loved the papers and. Um, proofs are very nice, and so that's that's another dog has done a huge amount of work in the area. And um, hmm. well, it's a, an extremely interesting line. Yeah, all these uh, deltas and all these boundaries between undefinability of order and logic's good for something is also very close. Our you know, work of Yoko and little one kappa in the yeah, and and I think you know another aspect of this work is you know people so are so confined to first order logic and first order methodology. Looking at you, John, <laughs> but um, but uh, you know sort of advocate if you bring in these these strong logics, you you know sometimes the picture of something like logicality or a squeezing arguments or something, you know, it's, you, you reveal something that you never would have 
come across before. And John, I know you work on, on strong. I think I think John John is happy to use an infinite yeah. logic if it helps. If it helps. Yeah, but I think it's it's also interesting that you know this huge debate about set theoretic entanglement, and you know Tarski doesn't mind at all. He says cardinality. Take that to be logical. That's fine with me. So um, it's interesting history of, I think he died a uh, couple of years later, but this John Corcoran um, fellow, he sat down with Tarski and he said, look, we really need to, pu you really need to publish this lecture. And Tarski agreed to it and they started editing it together. And so it really is, um, you know, part of Tarski's oeuvre. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. I was I was wondering at the beginning. Yeah, why it was published so late. And so yeah, late. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> in the that big, big, multi-volume Tarski thing. But okay, well, friends, uh, seeing you all, Juan and Andres and John Good. and Jess Good. and Good. Yeah, Good. Javier. We don't see you and Pedro. Makes me really yeah. miss uh, miss. We have to go all. to a restaurant oh. because we haven't gone to a restaurant for a year. Or, or we more. have to drown <laughs> drown so. our sorrows that we cannot so. see see you all, and uh, so we're hoping. Um, we're, oh, there's Javier. There's Javier. I, I'm yeah. sorry because I have I have had a com communication problems. That's why I didn't appear. Okay. Talk at all, but. I have a lot of problems, but thank you for the talk. Uh, uh, it's really inspiring. Um, yes. I just want to say something, if, if, if there is a minute. Uh, uh -huh. uh, going yes. in the other direction, instead of uh, considering the role of isomorphism to clarify the, what a logical concept is, one, perhaps one should go in the other direction, weakening the 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 <clears throat> the relation, uh, for example, for Frese, my feeling is that for Frese, a, 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 a concept is logical only if you can get it as an invariant of partial isomorphisms, things like that. It's so Pfefferman, Pfefferman's late work. Oh, there's Alan. <laughs> Pfefferman's late work. There's my brother-in-law, Alan Delahoy, physicist. Uh, Pfefferman's late work, uh, last few papers, Hi, suggest a homomorphism, for example. So that's exactly, yeah. Oh. Yes, yes, yes. Pfefferman thought that homomorphism would be the, the key, but then, then it turned out that it has the same problems. And Bonnet thought that the potential isomorphism is the key, but it also turns out to have the same problems. I think that this concept of logicality is very elusive, and maybe there is no, maybe it is not a well-defined concept at all. But then how can it be that logicality, which is so basic, is not a well-defined concept? It should be. You know. and, and, and you just cannot build a wall around it and keep out, you know, things like cardinality or being non-empty or maybe um, things like a like a political power or democracy or freedom are not well defined <laughs> but logicality should be well should defined. Be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so oh there's jess i could see jess in the corner yeah hi there hi there uh, alan what does your t-shirt just... say some physics thing i'm sure oh you're you muted, muted. Yeah. You're muted. You're muted. 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 Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm now you're... working on a difficult problem of uh, repairing a chair leg. Oh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> repairing a chair leg. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank thank you everybody for for listening. These Zoom. Oh, there's Patricia. <laughs> yeah. Hi. We Hello. miss you. Yeah, we I, miss I, you I, a lot. <laughs> Yeah, we miss yeah, Jess, I Jess and Alan. We miss we miss everybody. Pedro, miss John, Andres, we miss everybody. Javier, John. thank you. Nice to see you. Yes. Thank you. So we we are thinking of you in in Colombia and uh, Mexico. All the political. Yeah, this are. Sounds sounds really. 
Yeah. Sounds yeah. really bad. I wish we, yeah. But I hope in spite of all that, um, you know, a friend is getting married in Puerto Vallarta in 2022. Uh, Andres, uh, you know him, Miguel Angel. Oh, yes, so, yes. But, uh, so we'll be in so the, the, the political. The biggest political problem in Finland now is that it has turned out that the state has used uh, 300 euros per month, $300 per month to buy breakfast for the prime minister when she had to sleep in the office. Um, and, and somebody now complains that it is against the law to, to use state money to, be, to give <laughs> prime minister breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so every country has their own problems. We have this. <laughs> oh, so Luis Carlos, you're in you're in Maryland. Yeah, but I, uh, uh, I actually so, took, uh, the logic classes with Chris Laskowski. I am doing the PhD in pure mathematics, starting my career. Fantastic, <laughs> fantastic. So you, um, uh, but we we met in Bogota. Did we? Bogota, yeah, I was working yeah. with Alex Bernstein in continued. Indeed, logic. indeed. I remember you now. Yeah, yeah. Great. Well, let's correspond about, about pure concepts in Kant. That's a that sounds okay. like something that could be could could give a very nice context for these these ideas. Yeah. So when are you graduating? Uh, I am starting my third year, so I uh -huh. need to Quali uh, my second qualifying exam and my prelim exam and I believe three more years I have left here. Good for you. Good for you. Thank you. Well, keep us posted what you're doing. Thank um, you very much. It's good. Very nice okay. Program. So friends, big hug. Big hug. And uh, you are all in, in, in my heart and uh, hope to That's see you. Good. Hope to see you very soon. And regards to Fernando. Well, you. Yes. It's okay. Carlos. See you soon, yes. next year probably. Yes, in Cartagena. Okay, and Jess and Alan, so wonderful to see you. Thanks so much for coming. Bye, okay. Thank you very much for your talk. Okay. Bye. Bye.